Our guest in this first segment is Lucia Valentine. She is running in the Democratic primary for the 97th House of Delegates district seat. That's the one currently held by John Hardy. John will not be seeking re-election because he's going to attempt to get a seat on the Berkeley County Commission in that uh, election. Lucia, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right, you're already really high on my list because I found out that Lucia <laughs> is half Sicilian and the other half is regular Italian. <laughs> yes, so we're... <laughs> paisans yeah hey well, that's great because i don't meet a lot of uh, sicilians around the area i know likewise likewise now you spent some time in italy already i have yeah a few years ago i spent almost a month there with my family um it's beautiful i'd love to go back do you speak the language not as well as i would like to but i have the rosetta stone and i've been trying to learn oh very nice the, the last couple of years <laughs> yeah have you learned yet that sicilian has almost nothing to do with italian in terms of the language yeah i know it's its own separate dialect basically <laughs> hey, just, my grandmother just i swear she just made up words oh, for sure, for sure. I, I have no idea uh yeah. tell us a bit about your background your, where did you uh, grow up and where did you study Sure. So, um, and if you could lean into your microphone a little bit. Okay, more. certainly. Um, yeah. So my name is Lucia Valentine. I'm running for House of Delegates in District 97, which comprises parts of both Jefferson and Berkeley counties. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in the Shepherdstown area in Jefferson County. I'm a graduate of Jefferson High School and Shepherd University, and have lived in Berkeley County for the past few years as well. So I'm really excited at the opportunity to potentially represent both um, counties that I've been privileged to call home. What did you study when you were in school? I studied music, actually. Um, I'm a singer as well, and then my minor was in environmental science. What type of music do you sing? Uh, singer, songwriter, folk, pop, a whole mix of things. Did you bring any instruments with you? I did not. Um, we could we could get a little song maybe. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we could do a little impromptu. I have a CD. I should have brought you one of my CDs. Yeah, that one next time. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, from the environmental sciences standpoint, have you worked in the field at all? Yes, um, I've worked as an environmental advocate for the past few years um, at the state capitol, actually. Okay, and, and what sort of things have you advocated for? Sure, so we've advocated for legislation that would help protect uh, the resources and people of West Virginia, um, probably no, most notably to the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but we've worked mm -hmm. on the PFAS Protection Act, which passed last year. Um, um, which aim to address the PFAS pollution across the state. Um, the Eastern Panhandle, unfortunately, is a hot spot of that pollution. PFAS is a forever chemical that's found in our drinking water supply. So we passed a bill that would direct the West Virginia DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, to identify the PFAS uh, pollution and find ways, create action plans to clean up that pollution. Were you involved at all in the situation at the Guard? Um, not personally, but I know that that's kind of where some of our PFAS pollution in the Eastern Panhandle originated from the firefighting foam that had PFAS in it. Um, it's since been um, banned, but I know the initial kind of problem with PFAS started there and it's kind of trickled its way into some of our other drinking sources. And, um, you know, we have a lot of private wells in the Eastern Panhandle. I'm on a well. And so I think we really need to kind of transition into looking into helping people test their wells and figuring out how to filter out PFAS. Mm -hmm. so. And have you uh, made any forays into the political field previously? I have not. This is my first time. Why now? Um, I'm really... I think that my experience working at the state capitol for the past few years, uh, working in a bipartisan way to pass legislation has really um, helped prepare me, prepare me for this moment. And I really um, am running for office because of the love that I have for my community and the Eastern Panhandle. I think at a time when our political climate is very divided across the state, we need leaders who are willing to be transparent and who can listen to the needs of the people of the District 97, um, who can recognize that it's not just about party, but about our shared values and what we can accomplish when we work together um, to find solutions to the problems that uh, the district faces. If elected, what would be on your list of the things you'd like to tick off on the agenda? Sure. So some of the values and issues I want to focus on are, of course, with my background, ensuring access to clean air and clean water here in the Eastern Panhandle, making sure that we're supporting our public school teachers and workers, um, making sure that we're supporting our labor workforce, and um, making sure that we're promoting responsible development, all under the broader context of finding opportunities for young people like myself to stay in West Virginia, to come home to West Virginia, and to be able to live here and raise families here. Lucia Valentine is our guest. She is a candidate in the Democratic primary for the 97th House of Delegates district seat. Mr. Miller. Uh, Lucia, you mentioned responsible development. And, of course, here in the eastern panhandle, we are watching development go hog wild. 
And uh, without uh, the opportunity to have zoning, especially in Berkeley County, you do have it in Jefferson County, mm -hmm. it has created some challenges. How do you see uh, the state legislature being able to help in those areas that might uh, allow for more responsible development? Certainly. I think in terms of when we're thinking of our infrastructure, you know, we're building lots of housing developments. We are starting to build new schools. Uh, I want to prioritize making sure that our roads are safe. We've had an increase in traffic. And I think the role of a state legislator, if I were to be elected, my job at the state level would to be um, to ensure that we could get state funds back home to the district to work on projects, infrastructure or economic development projects, um, and also to help secure some of the federal funding that's come in for over the past year plus. Um, again, to bring that money back to our communities is, is the role of the state legislator. Do, do you feel like that'll be a bit of a challenge, trying to get some of that uh, back to the panhandle when other parts of the state may say, you know, we don't have as much traffic, but I still have a crumbling road? <laughs> sure, yeah. I know that... Um, you know, we have to do it in an equitable way, and there's lots of projects across the state that need to be worked on, but I think, yeah. um, you know, the Eastern Panhandle is in a u unique position where we are growing, and we are, you know, kind of a hot spot in the state, and we have a lot of economic um, opportunity here, so I think that as much as it makes sense for the state to invest in, in the Eastern Panhandle, we should be able to capitalize on that. As you mentioned, uh, working in the Capitol and working with legislators, what did you experience from your standpoint as far as, you know, other parts of the state kind of versus the Eastern Panhandle, if you will, when it came to legislation? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I know the Eastern Panhandle has been working on is locality pay, right? Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we are advocating for the Eastern Panhandle, but doing so in an equitable way that doesn't leave the rest of the state behind. So I think... Um, finding ways to make it fair across the board. Uh, I think in terms of locality pay, I think that you know we've seen kind of a statewide raise for our um, state workers and teachers. I think that we need to go beyond that. And then additional to a larger statewide raise, I think that um, having locality pay in Berkeley and Jefferson counties would be beneficial um, to help invest in the counties that you know surround states that pay much higher. We need to be more competitive and be able to retain our workers and young people and teachers here. Sure. You're going to be running for what will be a, or are running, I suppose, for what will be an open seat. Mm -hmm. um, but it has been controlled by uh, Republicans for quite some time. So what really, essentially, you're asking the public to fire the Republican and go with the Democrat instead. Yeah. What is that difference? What What are the changes that you would like to see? What's broken that you want to be fixed in terms of the current strategies that are going on? Sure. Well, I really believe that we need to be able to push past divisive um, political narratives here in the state. And so I think that I would work across the board to try to get things done regardless of political party. Um, and I also believe that, you know, things have become very volatile uh, in politics. And I think that scares a lot of people from getting involved. So I really want this campaign to be positive, to be fo solution focused, um, and f again, finding ways that we can work together to get things done. And I think that I have the experience to help do that and work across the board. Why, since it is an open seat, why not run as a Republican and you, and you get that extra historical advantage of having the R instead of the D after your name? Yeah, I think that I think we see too much of that in politics where people kind of bend on their values and they want, they ah, just focus What are on, the values that you'd be bending on if you went Republican? Sure, well, Democrat. I think that the values of the campaign, um, you know, focused, the issues that I want to focus on, um, again, attracting young people, um, you know, clean air and clean water, investing in our public schools, supporting our workers, those are traditionally values of the Democratic Party. You know, the Democratic Party has been the party of the people and the workers and the families. Um, so I do feel like I'm more closely aligned, and I've been a lifelong Democrat, so I don't want to, um, you know, change that just to get elected. I want to show up authentically and, again, um, try to push past partisan narratives so that we can work together regardless of political party. I think that's what the voters expect. But it is a partisan process. You, sure. you can't get past that. So is there something that the current Republican leadership, which is vast, that the Republican leadership, is there a ball that they have fumbled in terms of, say, uh, the environment and clean drinking water and that sort of thing? Um, I mean, I think when it comes to the environment, I think um, 
you know, I would advocate for an all of the above energy approach. I think the state's actually done a good job um, in kind of transitioning towards towards that and recognizing that we, you know, still need to invest in our fossil fuel sources, coal and natural gas, but also need to look forward and make sure that we're ahead of the game in terms of bringing, you know, renewable energy to West Virginia. So I think on the environmental standpoint, yes, um, of course, um, I think the Democratic Party does a better job of kind of holding um, industry accountable and making sure that, you know, uh, polluters are cleaning up their pollution and things like that. Um, I know, you know, a right to a clean environment is more of a Democratic value. So I do agree with you there. And those are things that I would want to bring to the campaign. But again, first and foremost, I think that um, I want to find ways to work together with everybody and find solutions to the problems that the voters bring up. We mentioned before the show that I'm a relative newcomer to West Virginia, and one of the, the things here that has always baffled me is the whole resistance to locality pay. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it, I don't understand, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, so I, w I want you to expand on it if you can. You want to have locality pay that is somehow equitable to the rest of the state. So if, in fact, there's a pay increase based on property value or whatever is the metric that it's, it's going to be. And the folks in Eastern Panhandle, the teachers say get a, uh, a pay increase as a result. Mm -hmm. How does that harm anybody in the, in the belly of the state where the current teacher pay mm -hmm. is pays for everything that they need? It's, it's, it's a very good salary. So how, how does what happens in Eastern Panhandle harm what it doesn't apply to elsewhere? Yeah, I don't think that it necessarily harms. I think the general attitude is that, you know, the Eastern Panhandle, you know, that we're kind of like rolling in money and we're just asking for more and more. I think that we do need to be investing in other parts of the state, though, as well. So I think that locality pay makes sense in, in the Eastern Panhandle. And if there's a time that it would make sense in another part of the state, then we should be advocating for that as well. And, you know, I do understand the cost of living changes throughout the state. Um, but making sure that we're still investing in those communities where cost of living might be cheaper, um, maybe because there's less economic development and, you know, towns and cities need to be revitalized across the state. So making sure we're kind of looking at it, looking at the full picture um, when it comes to locality pay would, would be what I would be interested in. But I do think that um, the Eastern Panhandle would be the place to start and that it makes sense here um, for us to be competitive and, uh, again, retain our young people and our workers here. Are you ready to take on the teachers' union for this <laughs> when you get to the state house? I've talked with some of them already, so and? working on building those relationships. Um, yeah, I, I really want. Is to there hope? Do they the people you've talked to within the union? Do they is there is there a kernel of agreement that yes, we think that there should be um, uh, locality pay for the border counties? I think that you know opinions definitely vary, but um, I'm really interested to learning more about learning more about how they feel, and um, again, advocating for our public school teachers and workers is going to be um, a big priority of mine. So finding ways that we could come to agreement. Lucia Valentine is our guest here on the program. She is a candidate for the 97th. That's the seat John Hardy currently holds. He is not running for re-election. Uh, Matt, you had a question. Well, I was just going to ask. I mean, it, it seems sometimes that semantics is is the real issue, right? The the southern part of the state doesn't like the idea of, of quote-unquote locality pay. Uh, if we just change the terms to a housing allowance or something along those lines, does that make a difference? Can you convince people more easily in that regard because it's a tangible thing? The objection thing? to that in the past, Matt, from – teachers themselves has been that if you do a housing allowance it doesn't help their pension though mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and pensions based on your salary so if you call it a housing allowance yeah it, what it was, help you what was the workaround phrase they came up with for essentially locality keeping more pay. of the local share was something that Dale Lee has suggested mm -hmm. in the past yeah increasing the local and share. I do want to add to the point of the teacher I think that like I stated before, I do believe that we need a statewide raise for our teachers and workers beyond the five mm percent. -hmm. So I think, I do believe I want our teachers to have higher wages beyond locality pay statewide. So I want to prioritize that and then look at ways that locality pay could make sense for the Eastern Panhandle. Lucia, let's talk about education. You look like you're relatively young, at least compared to the people in this room. <laughs> That's not a high bar. <laughs> so I presume then that you've had a recent relatively recent experience with West Virginia's education system. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you like about it? What do you think could be done to improve the education system in West Virginia? At least based on the information we get from test scores, it ranks usually toward the bottom in the country. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I'm a product of our West Virginia public schools, and like I said, went to Shepherd University. Um, I think that, you know, especially since I've graduated, things have changed dramatically, hearing from my friends that are teachers or friends that have, you know, kids still in the school system. Um, I think that we need to be investing in our public school system, looking at looking at it structurally and seeing how we can improve. I think, again, raising um, the wages for our teachers and workers will help with retention, will help with um, quality of our educa education system and making sure that we're retaining quality educators. And I think that that um, would help you know, our test scores and help our, our students succeed if we're properly educating and investing in them. That'll certainly help retain some teachers. Uh, it'll help, uh, especially with those who decide to retire maybe ahead of schedule or just leave the profession. Uh, and by having better teachers in the classroom, it obviously helps to increase the quality of the education. But we're seeing more than just not having qualified uh, enough qualified or experienced teachers. We're also seeing uh, in the classroom, because of a lack of discipline on occasion, a lack mm -hmm. of attendance, uh, and, and maybe a lack of parental involvement as well. Uh, all of that kind of makes up that pie that leads to a lower test score. Any thoughts on how you can address those issues? Yeah, I'm really interested in actually going into our schools and talking with teachers and administrators and students themselves about um, you know things that they would like to see change. I am going to be shadowing um, somebody at Jefferson High School and would like to do the same thing at Martinsburg. So I do want to look into that more and figure out, hear from people directly in the schools and ways that they they feel like the state could help them succeed. So you mentioned things that worked when you were in school and you've heard otherwise since you've graduated can you cite a couple of those examples yeah well i you know i graduated pre-covid so i do think so much has changed about the dynamic of the classroom since covid um and i think that we had you know there wasn't a teacher shortage crisis was when i was in public school so we really had you know one-on-one -on -one attention with teachers i think that it was kind of right around the time that more technology was being introduced in the classroom and so um I think that you know has become an asset, um, and those are some of the things that um, that I experienced. Matt, staying on education, um, we talk a lot about teachers and what would be your elementary and and your secondary level. Uh, we've had some issues in the state with higher education and and our college systems and WVU cutting programs and so forth. Uh, what are you seeing going on there, and and maybe some things that that could help to improve that situation? Yeah. Um, I think it's definitely disappointing to see different programs get cut. I think that's, you know, when we're thinking of attracting young people back to West Virginia and we want our young people to go to our um, universities, I think we need as many, you know, options and programs as possible. So I personally was disappointed to see some of the cuts that happened at WVU and Shepherd themselves. Do we need to, and I know it's been a conversation at times uh, across the state, but I don't know that it's happened at all. As far as a consolidation for the size of our state, um, do we have too many, you know, colleges and uh, we really have two major universities in Marshall and WVU, but there are so many of the smaller colleges like a Shepherd, a Fairmont State, a Bluefield and so forth. Right. Do we need to consolidate? Um, that's definitely something that I'm still kind of learning more about mm -hmm. and kind of figuring out where I stand on the issue. But um, I think it's, you know, it's a topic that I've been looking into and um, learning more about. So I'd be interested in kind of talking to the people in those spaces as well and figuring out um, how they feel. On a lighter note, with your background in, in music and singing, will you be writing some of your own jingles and material to, uh, you know, yes, draw people in? that has been, that's come up. Yeah, All right. we're working on a campaign song. <laughs> Good. Well, that's pretty cool. One of our viewers Thanks. on our Facebook live stream said that you have a lovely voice Aww. and your father, Dominic, mm -hmm. he plays an instrument? He plays guitar, yes. Plays guitar? He plays with me at most of my shows. I have a son, Dominic. Really? Oh, this Thanks. is great. <laughs> yeah. We're related. Kind of, if you think about it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gilstrap, final question for Lucia. Final question. We talked about ad advocating for teachers. Mm -hmm. Boom. I wave my hypothetical magic wand. Everybody's got the pay raise they want. What's the next issue for teachers? Um, that's a great question. I really look forward to talking more about them, uh, more about that with them when, when, I, when I shadow some in the school system here. Let's talk foster care in the state, Lucia. How much have you looked into that as an issue, and how aware are you of the issue? Yeah, I've learned. I've learned about the issue. Um, I think that 
you know, we do have a foster care crisis going on here in West Virginia. It's something that I'd want to focus on if I were elected. Um, I know that foster care and child care are huge issues across the state. Have you identified any other issues that you want to focus on? Yes, I think, um, again, clean air and clean water, supporting our public school teachers and workers, responsible development. I think um, going back to that when we are looking at economic development, making sure that we have responsible companies that are coming and locating in West Virginia and the Eastern Panhandle, making sure that um, local citizens have a voice in the decision making and permitting process, and that those companies that are coming here would, you know, contribute, make contribute to ensuring that we have clean air and clean water. Um, I also, you know, have been somewhat familiar with the, the kind of home rule discussion and 1% sales tax. I, I definitely think that that's an issue that um, we could leave up to the voters. If home rule legislation was passed this session, you know, mm -hmm. I would have to see what's in the bill to determine whether or not I fully support it. But I think if it were to pass, I would generally support letting counties decide on the 1% sales tax issue. I've talked to police officers and other public, um, you know, service workers about, um, the need for more funding, and I understand those services more, need more funding, so if that's something that voters decide that they would um, support, then I would support that as well. Very good, and a minute left, anything else you'd like to tell our listeners who could be voters in your district? Certainly, yes. Um, I have a website, valentineforwv.com. You can learn more about the campaign, how to get involved, how, how to volunteer with us. Um, I have a campaign launch event happening on January 13th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Bavarian Inn in Shepherdstown. So anyone in the district or beyond in the Eastern Panhandle would like to join us for that, please please do. Um, you can find me on Facebook and reach out anytime if anyone in the district has questions or, or issues that they'd like to raise. And I really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. How do you think it went good i feel good thanks guys how these guys do questioning you <laughs> good they did all right yeah all right very nice hey do you know that john doyle guy pretty well sorry mr john doyle do you know john yes i yeah. do yeah are you, are you gonna see him anytime soon um probably all right tell him i said hello i will all right. <laughs> probably sometime this week <laughs> thank you lucia thank you guys